I'm going to start my lecture with a question. Um, why does literature and not any of the other arts appear in this series uh, on, uh, of lectures on COVID-19 next to the sciences and uh, histories of pandemics? It's going to be quite a different lecture perhaps than uh, uh, the ones that have preceded uh, me. So uh, I'm going to try to give you an answer and a general uh, introduction to uh, literature and pandemics in the first half of my lecture. Um, and first, um, well, why do we turn to uh, literature at all? Maybe it's because we have been telling stories uh, from the beginning of times uh, as we evolved as a species. And storytelling, uh, which is an instance of uh, symbolic thinking, lies at the basis of, the cognitive of our cognitive development. Stories are at the root of our survival because they got us going long ago in the first place, when we were still uh, painting rock art in caves. It may therefore not surprise you that uh, in cultures around the world, uh, stories um, and keeping yourself alive, telling stories and keeping yourself alive has, has been intimately uh, connected. In one of the famous instances of this connection between stories and keeping yourself alive is uh, Shahrazad in the Thousand and One Nights. Does any of uh, you know the Thousand and One Nights the students? I would like to hear perhaps in the, in the chat. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, frame narration that Shahrazad uh, has because uh, uh, the case is that she married this king who hates women because his first wife uh, betrayed him. So then he went on killing all the wives he married ever since to revenge her. Now, however, Shahrazad is there and she has a secret weapon. She is a great storyteller, an excellent storyteller with a lot of knowledge on top of it. So the king is mesmerized when she starts telling her story and he begs for more. But then Shahrazad stops in the middle. More tomorrow. This is how she saves herself and keeps herself alive, by telling a story each day that ends with a cliffhanger. Um, we also, stories keep us alive because they give us hope also. Hope that life will continue, as in the Thousand and One Nights, and that we may flourish in the future. Consider Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, which was written between 1349 and 1355 about, just after the Black Death had struck Florence. I think maybe this title has been mentioned before. It consists of a series of novellas or new forms, each told by a member of a group of 10, seven women and three men. This group has left Florence to bond, to forge a new community, and imagine the world anew through the stories they tell each other. They do, not, they do not use old and rigid, tried ways of telling stories, but they try new ones, as their world, they think, has changed for good. They even attempt new democratic modes of sharing. Storytelling, perhaps, it's not just a means of personal survival, it's also a social good, which is perhaps why I'm in this lecture series tonight. I have no clue. And it's perhaps also for this reason that storytelling um, is annually awarded a Nobel Prize alongside chemistry, physics, economics, and peace. It's a bit of a silly prize, we all know this. Uh, still, we are foolishly enough to engage with it, as Tom Parks has rightfully said it. But why do you think literature is there? It's a bit of an enigma to me. Does it create meaningful, transformative insights? Does it help to make the world a better place? So let's look at the assessments of uh, a couple of Nobel Prize winners who have written on uh, pandemics and epidemics and disease. And perhaps we get an answer to this question. So the first one and the most hackneyed one is of course uh, Camus, Albert Camus, and he got his prize in 1957. Oh, and note, uh, there are very few women who won a Nobel Prize uh, because women have been, you know, I'm not going to explain why, we all know. Um, 
Uh, but in any case, uh, I have to focus on some men because it's mostly men who got in the prize. Um, and Albert Camus has reportedly enlightened problems of human conscience in an authentic way. So that's his contribution to humanity, he has enlightened problems of human conscience in an authentic way. And he has written about people who may rise above themselves in times of evil, and that's what we like to read. We like to read uh, that people become better and their better self when they are tried and tested. It gives us hope. Then in 1982, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez got the prize. And uh, what did he have to bring to humanity? He allowed us to penetrate different cultures and continents. So he made us familiar with what is strange and far away. And Love in Time of Cholera uh, is, a, is a very nice example of a story about disease, even if it's not about disease at all, because cholera also means passion, which we will be presently seeing. And so disease is also a metaphor for raging passion. And then in 1998, uh, Jose Saramago, a Portuguese writer, uh, won the prize. Uh, a great writer, uh, and what did he do? He deployed imagination and compassion to penetrate realities in a different and illuminating way. Okay, so um, his novel uh, Blindness uh, is about a sudden epidemic where people turn blind and um, families are separated, society disintegrates, people are killed, uh, and then at the end, everything goes away again. Uh, the epidemic is like an allegory. So it stands for something else for us to ponder on. Um, and what's, what's at the core of this novel is, I don't think we did go blind. I think we are blind, blind but seeing, blind people who can see but do not see. I will return to this uh, insight, blind people who can see but do not see who do not choose to see, uh, this insight I will uh, return to when I, I'm going to discuss the novel that you read and discussed this week, uh, William Somerset Maugham's uh, The Painted Veil. Okay, so uh, the conclusions that we can now draw uh, from these Nobel Prize winners. Uh, we can say, what do writers do? Writers do something that is worthy in times of difficulty and crisis, and they speak to a world rich in cultural diversity. Their imaginative abilities can educate readers into more sophisticated and compassionate levels of perceptiveness. They can train the creativity of these readers in a foundational sense. They can challenge them to explore fresh, uneasy, and unimaginable perspectives, as readers get to meet and live with all sorts of characters in different cultures and periods for a while. So this is a certain knowledge that literature brings to us. The knowledge that comes with experience gained through intense imaginative work. And sometimes that's hard to focus on imaginative work. Literature expands our horizon and it helps us to give meaning to life, to transform perception if necessary and if possible, and provides a context for future experiences. And this is a, it's a really important role for literature as it has been around for some centuries to provide a context for future experiences so we can also return to older stories to, to see what did people do in the past. This is why uh, today, in, during the COVID pandemic, uh, as the virus has been raging the world, novels on the plague and fictional viruses, uh, the Spanish flu, although just very little novels have been written about the Spanish flu because the World War I happened before, uh, and other kinds of pandemics, uh, they have skyrocketed. Like the, the La Peste, it has sold out uh, in its English stock. It has sold 300% more in France than in the year before. While uh, Dean Koons, The Eyes of Darkness, a very foreseeing novel because it's about the Wuhan 400 virus, and it was from 1981, 
uh, with symptoms closely resembling uh, those of the coronavirus, it has skyrocketing sales figures. So apparently people have a great need for stories in times of pandemics and crisis. So what's in a novel that can trigger, teach, confront or comfort us in such times? I want to explore that a little more. And then I will go to William Somerset Maugham's The Painted Veil. So I think we turn to novels and perhaps not just to histories uh, to get a bigger historical picture and a close and personal perspective to open our imaginations. We want to know how people lived through pandemics in the past, how they managed and survived, what they felt and what they feared. We can, for instance, reopen Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year from 1722. And I can highly recommend you reading this 18th century work. It was such a convincing work on the plague of London in 1665, the bubonic plague, that people thought it was a real journal from 1665. And that's no accident. Because when you read a first person account, which this one is, like Robinson Crusoe, which Daniel Defoe wrote as well in the 18th century, you are drawn into the story and you're very close to the narrator. And this fosters your engagement. And with engagement, you learn a lot faster. So what can we learn from this very old novel? Um, Normally, I would ask some of the students to um, read this passage. Is there anybody who would like to um, volunteer? I, I see that some have, many of you have uh, muted your microphones. Oh, sorry. Sometimes you hear my dog. It's a bit, uh, she's moaning. Anybody who would like to read this passage? Okay, I will read it myself. Um, so this is how a journal of the plague year opens, okay? It was about the beginning of September 1664 that I, among the rest of my neighbors, heard in ordinary discourse that the plague was returned again in Holland. For it had been very violent there, and particularly at Amsterdam and Rotterdam. In the year 1663, whither, they say, it was brought, some said, from Italy, others from the Levant, among some goods which were brought home by their Turkey fleet. We had no such thing as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and report of things. All was kept very private. Hence it was that this rumor died off again and people began to forget it as a thing we were very little concerned in and that we hoped wasn't true. And then of course, disaster struck. So what we read now at the very beginning um, about the dangers of secrecy in the absence of printed news networks. It's a vital aspect of democratic societies. And yeah, it's a, it's a contrast to, I would like to say, it's a contrast to the transparency and openness that we exper experience today. And yes, but only to a certain extent, of course. Uh, uh, openness is still a, an ideal that we aspire to. We haven't quite reached it yet. Mm. As we then read on in this remarkable work, we also discover something else, a bit, you know, disconcerting. What we read is a rehash of the past, I must say, that we are living right now, when the crisis of COVID-19 started. The initial disbelief and indifference. So we already see that a bit here, and you, you just hope it's not true, so you try to forget about it. Rumors of fake cures. I, he I heard many of them. Uh, people seeing the crisis as divine punishment. I heard many say that COVID-19 uh, is Mother Earth striking back. Uh, ineffective governance in many countries, uh, but also effective. Deception and fake solidarity. Fake, because Europe's lockdown means hunger for Africa and more victims dying from malaria or other diseases that we don't have in Europe. 
anxiety, the rich saving themselves at the expense of the poor. It's all the same. We have not progressed very far since three centuries ago. Humans are humans. And that's a great insight. That progress may be happening because we have better medication, although medication doesn't work right now, but that it's also always an illusion. So let's take that with us as a lesson from literature. It's perhaps not something that students of medicine can deploy to cure a population, but it's just an insight to take with them and to keep them humble. Okay, so now I'm getting to the novel that students have prepared for today. Oh, this is an image of uh, time that is recycling. Um, the novel that you have prepared for today is William Somerset Mom's The Painted Veil. It focuses on this power of illusion that is very, very strong in all societies uh, and how it may be broken in times of crisis. Um, how to become truthful with yourself. That's, that's what this novel is about, uh, if that's possible. It's dated in its language, it's repetitive, and it's also often cliched. And it's also painfully racist in its portrayal of the Chinese. But this story of a young, estranged British couple seems to tell us one thing. You can do all the good work you want as a doctor or a nun, but without personal awareness, you will never get yourself or anyone else anywhere. Okay, I got an email from the, from the students asking me, uh, so what can we learn from, from this book? Is there anything we can, we can take away from it? Because we don't get it. It's not about COVID-19. It's about cholera. Uh, it's about passion. Uh, it's set in China. Um, and uh, people die uh, by, well, by the millions. Um, it's not exactly the same. So what can we learn? Um, the thing is, in literature, um, you don't learn general rules. For instance, general rules to, to save people. You learn, you learn insights, some very useful, uh, on a very singular level. So it's about this story, these people, that gives you something to take away from it. Um, this is what I wanted to point out, so to really manage your expectations that literature won't give you a cure to save a population. But it will give you an indication how you could become perhaps a better doctor or a better nun, for that matter, because there's nuns in the novel, um, or a better healthcare worker. Uh, imagination can get you pretty far. Okay. William Somerset Mom uh, was a trained physician. He was a doctor himself. He never practiced um, because he was such a great writer that he could live off his novels from uh, right after he finished his uh, studies. Uh, but he used his skill for personal observation, which is something that doctors, of course, do, personal observation very well as a novelist. William Somerset Mom was extremely popular between the 1910s and the 1940s, though not exactly Nobel Prize winning material. Uh, but his big hits include Of Human Bondage and The Razor's Edge. So uh, The Razor's Edge is from 1944 and Of Human Bondage from 1915. The latter novel was the favorite novel of my father, who was a doctor as well. Uh, and it's about a, a traumatized World War I pilot who tries to find inner peace through embodied practice in India. I can tell you there is a whole set of writers preceding the hippie age that went to India, to ashrams, to find enlightenment. Uh, but that history perhaps has yet to be written. Um, but it's, it's a very fine instance of somebody th uh, seeking spiritual peace. Now, the painted veil is also a bit in this spiritual tradition. And it takes at its, at its motto a line from a poem by the poet Percy Shelley. The painted veil which those who live call life. 
that's the motto of the book, The Painted Veil, which those who live call life. Okay. Yeah, I'm already giving away, uh, of course, the, my, my comments with this line, um, because I wanted to ask you, what does this mean, of course? Well, uh, many of us go through life without knowing that we are enshrouded in this veil of self-deception. We are angry at others. We feel a suffering that may not be real at all because it's just imaginary. Uh, we have very harsh judgments of others uh, because we do not want to recognize some stuff in ourselves. We project all kinds of stuff onto other people. Um, and we have very, very ingrained stuff in us that we uh, that poisons us um and so we go to life knowing well not knowing that we are deceiving ourselves but then sometimes when we are hard pressed in difficult times in times of crisis times of evil as uh, camus would have said the field may be lifted who knows when we are pressured when we're cornered when we fall uh when we go through very very hard times some, you know, uh, disintegrate and others learn. And um, so this is why the painted wheel, uh, those who live call life, is at the beginning of this novel. Because Somerset Mom was really interested in uh, solving such problems. Um, yeah, you know, literature is like a, if you want a laboratory, a fictional laboratory, where people behave and feel and act in certain ways. And you as a reader, and of course, uh, firstly, uh, the writer, uh, you can test all kinds of behavior in this laboratory, how people, you can predict how people could behave. Uh, you can explore what are the implications of certain behaviors or feelings or insights. And then you can, you know, paint that in a life. And this is why literature is very, very interesting to people beyond uh, the, the the discipline itself. Um, well, lifting the veil is what happens to Kitty. Uh, Kitty is the main protagonist, uh, the protagonist, the main character of the painted veil. And, um, and the story revolves around her personal transformation uh, uh, against the background of an epidemic, an epidemic in China, a cholera epidemic. Now, it's very, very extraordinary that a male writer should take a female character, a female character, and focus on her personal development. Mostly novels are written, uh, written by men are about men. Uh, not so uh, this one and Somerset Mom, uh, who was queer, zooms in entirely on, on Kitty and how she transforms herself. In, she's caught in the prison of well, with, a, with a, a technical term, the prison of patriarchic society, which means that she is born into a society in the 1910s um, where women have no way of um, making their way in the world independently, economically. Um, they just have to depend on marrying well and uh, sketch out a life for themselves when they are even of a certain class, when they are in the in a in a working class they just need to work and die uh very very soon okay so um the story of the novel i have to share the story a bit because there's other people listening in uh so this might be a bit boring to the students um i would have loved one of the students to share the story um i don't see anybody volunteering yet yeah do you, Kina, due to the security all the microphones yeah. are but yeah. if they want to share they can type or raise their hand in the chat and then i can unlock their microphone yeah. so, so if, if there is anybody who would like to tell what this story is about they are welcome to do so uh, now or what you have discussed in the group in the afternoon yeah, that will come later. That will come okay. later. Okay. 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 Uh, I'm very curious to hear that, of course. So, uh, Ro Rose, do you see anybody? No volunteers. No volunteers. Well, okay. I have to do it myself then. Uh, what a what a disappointment. 
Um, so, uh, Kitty Garstin, that's uh, you see her at the top left because uh, a movie was made of this novel uh, in 26, if I remember well. Um, Kitty Garstin marries Walter Fane, who is at her right there, uh, in a panic. Uh, she's beautiful and could have married very well because of her beauty, but she waited too long. She thought she, had, she could choose for too long. So she, she settles for Walter Fane, a bacteriologist, and soon they move to Hong Kong where he has found a job. Um, she, uh, Kitty is bored with Walter because he's just dull and intelligent and he's not at all about fun in life. Uh, and she has an affair with a uh, charming but self-centered Charlie Temple, who you see there down at the right. Walter finds out and revengeful uh, corners Kitty. He says, well, either I give you a divorce uh, or you go with me to the city of Mai Tam Fu where a cholera epidemic is raging. Seeing through Charlie's narcissism, Walter is sure that Charlie will not divorce his wife and marry um, uh, Kitty or help her. And yeah, he won't. He, he's too selfish. He, uh, he wants to get rid of her. So go, she must, with Walter to uh, Mai Tam Fu. But instead of dying, which she fears and which uh, Walter intends, um, she grows. She starts growing. She starts seeing through Charlie and through her own needs and desires uh, and motives for loving him. So that's the most important part. She, she sees through her own motives for loving him. She experiences the pleasures of friendship and compassion as she starts helping the French um, convent with the French nuns who are situated in that town, who help cholera patients and orphaned Chinese uh, children, uh, uh, girls who have been rejected by their families. In the end, it is not Kitty, but Walter who dies. His last words are a line from the Elegy on the Death of a Mad Dog by an 18th century Irish poet. Oliver Goldsmith. He says, can you imagine right before you die, you give a quote? Okay, so he says, the dog it was that died. The dog it was that died. Why does Walter say this? The dog it was that died. And I must tell you, one of the students who uh, responded to the story and to my question, uh, so what do you think about Kitty's transformation? Uh, has uh, already discovered this. So I'm going to quote this student in a minute. First, you're going to read An Energy on the Death of a Mad Dog by Oliver Goldsmith. It's a really great piece of verse. Uh, rhythmically, um, it's very well done. So I'm giving you the last bits. Um, a kind and gentle heart he had, this was the master of a dog, to comfort friends and foes. The naked every day he clad when he put on his clothes. And in that town a dog was found, as many dogs there be, both mongrel, puppy, whelp, and hound, and curse of low degree. Then one day the dog bites the man, and he gets an awful wound in this uh, same poem. Everybody swears the man will die because of this wound. And the dog was mad. But then the man recovered from the bite. The dog it was that died. The man recovered from the bite. The dog it was that died. So this is a reversal of fortune. And remember this phrase, a reversal of fortune. Right before he dies, Walter receives a blow. With a shock, he realizes that not Kitty, but he is the mad dog, a curse of low degree. As my students, at my well, good, as this student writes, the plague did trigger Kitty's moral change. And maybe that's also the reason she was spared the horrible fate of dying from cholera. Her husband, Walter, refused this change. He never forgave Kitty and ended up suffering the consequences. So the implication is from the student, and I really like this comment, uh, it made me uh, in fact change uh, the last bit of, uh, of my talk here. 
uh, Kitty receives her blow in time, in, uh, apparently. Mm. And Mom describes the moment very well when she realizes that Charlie does not love her because, well, he can only love himself. And that Walter, hurt and vengeful, knew this all along. So Kitty falls in love with Charlie and uh, she, she doesn't see through him or, and, and, you know, most importantly, not through herself. She sees a very charming man who has the ability to, you know, to blow himself up, to inflate himself so that everybody loves him and everybody believes in him. Um, and then, uh, uh, but then when things come to, you know, uh, a crisis and when, when somebody needs to act, Charlie just walks away. And she had never, she had never expected this. She thought, you know, Charlie would help her because had been, he'd been so in love with her, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, mom, who wasn't very good with metaphors, uh, and this is why he always remained a sort of minor writer, uh, because he wrote in a nice plain language, which I rather like, uh, he has a great metaphor here for her shock. Um, and it goes like this. It's in the middle of the book. Vaguely, as when you are studying a foreign language and read a page which at first you can make nothing of until a word or sentence gives you a clue, and on a sudden suspicion, as it were, of the sense flashes through your troubled wits, vaguely she gained an inkling into the workings of Walter's mind. It was like a dark and ominous landscape, seen by a flash of lightning, and in a moment hidden again by the night. She shuddered at what she saw. So she shudders because uh, she starts learning a lesson. When you see your own faults clearly, uh, but you can forgive yourself for it, you can start becoming kinder to your people around you. But Walter, the good doctor who sacrifices himself for his patients, refuses forgiveness. So uh, he, he becomes mean. Uh, he becomes a mad dog after Kitty hurts him. And he cannot transcend uh, his suffering. He refuses her forgiveness. For him, the shock of self-insight comes too late. It is a shock of death, even though death is the ultimate transformation in itself, of course. Kitty, on the, uh, uh, she is, Kitty is aligned with death, on the other hand. She, she is pregnant, uh, it turns out, uh, with a girl, and she, she doesn't know whose it is, probably Charlie's. Um, but in any case, uh, it's a metaphor or a symbol that something new can happen, new life will be given birth to. So to answer the question of my students, uh, what do we learn from this novel? Um, well, what do we learn? It's a good question. Beware of vanity, of thinking you're better than others as uh, Walter does. The intelligent, good doing doctor above the once frivolous and selfish wife. Recognize that people can change and rise above themselves in very small ways. This is uh, what Kitty does. Or just make good use of the shocks in life and hope they come in time. I think that's, that's some good piece of advice. Make good use of the shocks in your life and hope they come in time. Kitty often tells her friend, Mr. Waddington, if death is all around us, what do we care about the little things that happen in life, like adultery um, or any other thing, a row, um, one day we're all going to disappear, we're all going to die, and, and we will not leave a trace. Today I saw a picture, for instance, of the house of my parents when they, and you know, nothing is, nothing is left. It's a completely uh, bare field. Their house is gone, the garden is gone, nothing is left. Only the mailbox that's still standing. And this will happen to all of us. We will go, we will die, we will leave no trace behind. And it's good because then new life can start again. The painted veil shows us that we should seize the moment, not just to enjoy life, as we often are told, eh? seize the moment, be happy, do it. No, it's seize the moment to be truthful with, with ourselves, to scrutinize ourselves so that we can be become more humane with others. I think, um, and that's, that's very important. Perhaps it's more important than, um, being, uh, than clapping for other people. Try to be more humane with others, and not just once. 
Another student noted that Kitty's transformation is not exactly complete. Uh, she doesn't believe in Kitty. Uh, and that's her good right. Because back in Hong Kong, uh, when Kitty has left my town Fu, uh, she sees Charlie again. And what happens? Lo and behold, they sleep again. And where they do that in the house of Charlie, where his wife is present, Dorothy. And, and she has been so kind to Kitty. Uh, but it doesn't feel good to Kitty. So read what she has to say. Shame, shame. She had thought herself changed. She had thought herself strong. She had thought she had returned to Hong Kong, a woman who possessed herself. And she had hoped to be so much better in the future. Freedom like a spirit of light had beckoned her. And now she seems to be back at the beginning. And uh, the student is certainly severe. She only seems to have changed. Her transformation is uh, just a veil. Um, but we can also interpret uh, this story differently. And uh, this is why I say um, we have to uh, practice self-scrutiny again and again, not just once. Freedom, is this is, if this is what is beckoning Kitty, uh, does not come suddenly and all at once. Uh, it comes and it goes. Freedom comes and goes, like happiness, it comes and goes. Transformation is never complete and every, anybody who thinks it can be complete, well, it's very, um, no, it's impossible. Awareness is never fully and stably reached because you keep on fooling yourself anyway. Everything is fleeting. Uh, as a good friend of mine would say, relax. Cholera, uh, which you know, passion is a trigger in this story to discover the fragility of freedom. This is what I think. It's a never ending process. And that is precisely the point of Kitty. The fact that she recognizes her vanity, her hopelessness, her shame, that's a good thing. That's a good start to uh, work on herself and, uh, and keep on working on herself. So all this may sound a bit, you know, soft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and ideal and idealistic. But I think for students of medicine and healthcare, self-scrutiny seems to me quite helpful. Often literature has been said to foster empathy. It trains us to understand another position, another's point of view. And this is why perhaps you have uh, this week engaged in creative activity, writing a poem, uh, to try other perspectives and to widen your horizon. Yet, as the painted veil shows, true compassion only comes when we can forgive the ones we despise the most. That's the big challenge. And when we realize that our viewpoints, interpretations may be wrong, think that you might be wrong. That should be um, well, that should be the motto of all our lives. Think, think that you might be wrong. And I think that's a great motto for a doctor, uh, by the way. It's not just literature, the stories that we read, I think, but the practice of literary interpretation that will get us to that realization, that will get to us to work with that motto in a meaningful way. There is a philosopher called Hans Georg Gadamer, uh, and uh, he was a student of Heidegger. Well, I shouldn't say that because that was the big sorrow in his life, that he was the student of the big philosopher Martin Heidegger. But there, I already said it. Uh, and what he said is that literary interpretation, historical interpretation, the science of interpretation at large, is not simply an academic activity of scholars immersed in books, but a mode of being uh, of human life itself a mode of being of human life itself. We interpret every day. I mean, um, when you get up and you open your eyes, you're already interpreting the room around you. You interpret signs, uh, traffic lights, uh, the dog wanting to go out of the house, uh, everything we interpret in a split second. So the life that we lead and the experiences that we have, we are already scrutinizing that uh, even on an unconscious level. And 
we project meanings onto people all the time, as I just uh, already uh, pointed out to you. Ourselves and, and events, just as we project meanings onto text. And just try to be aware uh, how often we do that. It's incredible. We have this, this uh, uh, viewer or projector in our head and uh, we keep on projecting meaning onto others and they haven't asked for such meanings uh, in the first place. All our lives, we have to learn to, to, to target these projected meanings and to think that they may be false, that people or events may resist such meanings and that we may need to revise our position. So Hans Georg Gadamer, the philosopher, uh, remember him because he has made uh, scientific academic uh, science, the science of interpretation, um, into a position, uh, an embodied position in the world that you should take up and constantly say to yourself, think that you might be wrong. And then uh, research and think again and work hard again to get to the truth, to get to uh, a good result or to get to other meanings. A little Hans Georg Gadamer may perhaps do a world of good to students of medicine, to engage with their patients who may be eluding them and to healthcare workers having to face difficult cases of life and death. The diversity of responses from the students to the story already illustrates the point. Even when you think you're in agreement with someone, with someone at the same level, you are probably not. Mostly you are not. So um, to wrap this up, um, our current fascination with pandemics has led us to literature in this lecture. Um, it's a bit of a dangerous fascination that we have uh, with literature at this moment. We turn to great writers and their stories uh, to find solace in a time of what we think is big change. And that's what we like, huh? uh, a, a big story saying, well, now the world uh, is going to be uh, completely different from what it was before, brace yourselves, etc, uh, etc. Et um, but then life is change. Everything changes constantly. Things have never been uh, the same. And uh, this is also what the novel by Somerset Mom has taught us. Um, before and after do not really exist. So be not just uh, prepared for the big shock that comes to change your life, uh, but be prepared to be constantly aware in little and seemingly insignificant ways in your professions uh, or as a friend, as a mother, as a father, uh, as a teacher. Uh, 